Thank you for the introduction, Sarah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Dublin, for those of you who've come today. Uh, for anyone that's here for the first time, if you look at the sunshine outside, that is standard for Ireland. We live in a world of sunshine. Um, so it's very usual for us, and hopefully we can enjoy some of that sunshine uh, after today's talks. OK, so we've just gone through some of the great content that exists on YouTube. And we've learned a bit about what makes content great for YouTube. Um, but I'm here to talk to you a little bit more about how to distribute that content in an effective way. So obviously at Google, we understand that you guys understand your brands far better than we do. Um, you understand the audience you're trying to target. You understand the message that you're trying to put behind that brand. And we don't always want to come and sit down and talk to you about exactly what type of content you should create. But instead, at times, we want to talk to you about the tactics and planning that you can put in place around um, distributing that content effectively on YouTube, which is a really, really difficult thing to do. So often, when we talk about YouTube at Google, we will talk to you about the millions and millions and millions of hours that are, um, that are uploaded every single day on YouTube. But ultimately, as brands, that can present a problem. Because trying to find your, your audience trying to find your video on YouTube is sometimes a bit like finding a needle in, an, in a haystack or even trying to find where's Wally. So when, you're, when your audience is, we've seen so many examples in the past of uh, producers that make absolutely brilliant content, content that everyone is really, really proud of, huge amount of energy, effort, and investment that goes into the content. But when it gets uploaded onto YouTube, a lot of the time, the approach is often to cross your fingers and hope for the best and not to devise a very, very clear plan about how to get the best out of the, 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 um, the content that you've already built. To, make, uh, to put you at ease a little bit, um, the top 100 brands that are advertising with YouTube, so the top 100 brands that are advertising with YouTube in terms of ad spend also really, really struggle with this. So I don't know if many of you are from the top 100 brands. Uh, I expect the majority of you are from brands that are slightly smaller than the top 100. But it might be encouraging for you to know that more than half of all of the content created by our 100 biggest partners don't get more than 1,000 views. So it's incredibly difficult to distribute your content uh, in a very effective manner. Um, so it's really important that you put together that plan to make sure that you do it as effectively as possible. So before I talk a little bit about the various strategies that you can adopt um, when it comes to distributing your content on YouTube, it's important that you take a step back and understand what it is that your audience are doing to engage with YouTube. So until you understand how your audience engages with YouTube, um, it's very difficult to just blast your content up there and hope that uh, that audience bites. And the reason that they, the, the area around um, their engagement with YouTube is passion points. And those passion points can vary incredibly from huge mainstream passion points like the latest Rihanna video or the latest Lady Gaga video, which millions, tens and hundreds of millions of people will go and watch, to very, very niche and sometimes weird passion points where a brand new community has developed that we've never seen before. And as content creators, that presents a really interesting opportunity for you guys because we've never seen mass audience in niche groups. In the past, if you had a niche product or a niche message, it was very difficult to get that mass reach. You would maybe find some uh, specialist magazine with a small enough readership and try and create some sort of awareness through that, but it was difficult to get that huge reach. The beauty category is a brilliant example of that on YouTube. So in the past, if you were a beauty product and you wanted to reach an audience that were interested in beauty, it would have been quite difficult to do that outside of magazines. Um, whereas now, we see an absolutely enormous community of users on YouTube who are interested in beauty. There are 500 million views per day uh, within the beauty category. So um, as brands, that presents a really interesting and exciting opportunity to target and distribute your content in a way that's never been done before. So once you've understood what it is that your particular audience are passionate about, the next challenge is to find the overlap between your brand's position 
and that consumer passion point. And it's sometimes difficult to do. So even if you understand that your audience might happen to be interested in extreme sports or uh, some sort of beauty product, you also need to have credibility as a brand in order to target that accurately. And a really good way to illustrate that example is Red Bull. Now, Red Bull have managed to um, find that perfect overlap between their brand positioning, which is Red Bull Gives You Wings, and the adventure sports, the area in which they've, um, they've been involved with for 20 years. And often when I sit down with some of my clients and I talk about the overlap between their passion point and their brand positioning, the feedback I'll always get from clients is, well, Red Bull's not a fair example. You can't talk about Red Bull because it's impossible to recreate that. They got lucky. What they did was a bit of a fluke, and that's too ambitious for me. There's no way I can do that. But we would absolutely refute that at Google. Red Bull have succeeded here because they've shown incredible consistency in order to do this. So they spent 20 years investing all of their content to be distributed towards adventure sports activists. And now that they've done that, it's become much easier for them to distribute their content in that place because they have credibility uh, with that audience. And the more you do it, the easier it becomes because now when Red Bull create some sort of hero content like uh, the Stratos Jump, or even they sponsor some sort of adventure sports, they have that credibility, so their audience expects them to be there, and therefore it's not as difficult for them to um, push out that content within those, those uh, platforms. Okay, so I'd actually like to see a show of hands now. Has anyone ever seen this before? Um, it's our framework for distributing content on YouTube, so I see a couple of hands. It used to be Hero Hub Hygiene. We've now rebranded it to Hero Hub Help, and that's to make it easier for you guys to understand how they exist as content distribution uh, platforms. This is more the type of content, so I won't talk too much about what they are as content, because I'm talking to you about distribution of content. But Hero is that big, major campaign. So that's the Dove sketches. They're the Volvo trucks, um, the very loud, big impact message that you're trying to get across for your brand. Um, Hub. Hub can be thought about as episodic content, so regular content that is not as big ticket, but is regular in its nature and will attract your audience to keep coming back because that episodic content uh, shows, shows the type of content that your audience are passionate about to want to come back. And then thirdly, and potentially most interestingly, with the onset of digital, there are so many um, social, platform, social media platforms that exist that a lot of brands have seen a huge amount of feedback about either their brand or the product category that their brand exists in. And those questions that are continuously asked about brands or the product category, the help format is the content distribution format where you can answer those questions and provide answers, like Mark's McDonald's example earlier, um, where your audience will then be able to get information around concerns um, or feedback that they have. So I'm going to go through some examples of those three categories. Um, but first, I wanted to make it clear that when I talk about uh, Hero, Hub, and Help, they exist in tandem. So it's not a case as a brand that you pick one and you ignore the other two, or you pick two and ignore one. It's important that you consider all three strategies at the same time. So while you're planning your big one-off Hero content, your big one-off Dove Sketch type content, you're also thinking about what you can do around the help and what you can do around hub. Every single client I've ever had who comes up to me with an interest in YouTube will always say, right, over the last two or three years, we've seen that the majority of our audience has moved from offline media channels onto digital and especially YouTube. We now understand that we need to be present on YouTube and we want a Dove Sketches which is really, really difficult to do, right? So a brand that's never been on YouTube to sit down and recreate something that's as incredibly successful as Dove Sketches can't be done overnight. So nearly everyone wants to try and run before they can walk. And what I always say to them is, listen, keep thinking about your hero content. Don't forget about it. But while you're thinking about it, start on Hub and Help. So start building that audience on your channel that 
you can then target much more easily once you've created that hero content. Instead of getting the home run uh, on your first attempt, be a bit smarter about how you plan your content and then your content distribution, and that will allow you to be in a better position to roll out your hero content once it comes. Okay, so before I get into some of the examples of Hub, Hero, and Help, I just wanted to talk a little bit about measurement. You'll always hear in any digital conversation how important measurement is. Um, and we tend to talk about views all the time when it comes to YouTube. Views is the most obsessive metric for anyone who works uh, on YouTube. Like I've often been with clients and agencies who've literally refreshed their browser to look at how many views because that is king and country of the measurement of a campaign. I will always agree that views are incredibly important and we often talk about views in, in a lot of these presentations, but obviously no brand has ever survived as a profitable product by a public view count ticker on YouTube. It's one piece, but it is only a small piece in terms of the overall bigger picture and your wider strategy. So to talk a little bit about some of the measurement uh, approaches that you should follow, it can be confusing because we have about 50 different types of, 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 of metrics available. And, and often, the availability of so many data points can be confusing when it comes to knowing how well your campaigns are performing. But really, you shouldn't make this too complex. Uh, I, I would try and simplify it by honing down on what your objective is and then looking at the types of metrics that you should be looking at based on those objectives. So for example, if you're looking at audience, the obvious media measurement uh, metrics are demographics, geography, and reach. To go back to that Turkish Airlines example that Mark showed earlier, um, the Lionel Messi and Kobe Bryant example, when Turkish Airlines first decided to build this content, and they would have had conversations with lots of different uh, media publishers, but they would have spoken to YouTube as well. They didn't understand how to start. Turkish Airlines is a massive brand that is present in over 100 markets. So when they came to us, they said, how do we figure out how to put together a content distribution strategy for our 100 markets? And what they did was they took a lot of the guesswork out. They looked at who was engaging with their brand, who was active with their brand based on previous campaigns they did, campaigns that they did, and realized that there were 20 markets that were much more important to them for their business, but as well as because they were, there was a huge amount of engagement and traction um, in the past. And once they'd figure out what those 20 markets were, they were able to target them according to their demographics, geography, and reach with that Kobe Bryant uh, ad, which became one of the ads of the decade on YouTube. If one of your objectives is content, um, again, I would look at retention, completion rates, watch time, and brand lift surveys. A, a brilliant example of this is Netflix. So Netflix were huge in the US. They decided to launch in Europe, um, and they were trying to expand their footprint in Europe once launched and couldn't figure out what was the right content in order to do that. And while they were trying to look at the best type of content, they were looking again, they were trying to learn from the insights that are available uh, through all of our trend tools. And they saw that while people didn't really care about Netflix as a brand, they cared hugely about the shows that Netflix streamed. So I'm not really that interested in Netflix, but I love um, House of Cards or Orange is the New Black. So what they did then was they hired some of the actors uh, from Orange is the New Black or from House of Cards, and they recreated those characters, but in branded Netflix content. Because they understood that that content was what was really important, and that was successful enough to give them a 30% uplift in um, brand recognition based off the back of that campaign. And then finally, in terms of your KPIs, when it comes to actions. So, <laughs> Again, it's not just about view count. You shouldn't just look at how many views are ticking up every day. Um, you also need to look at what your audience are doing when they do look at your content. Um, the obvious things to look at in terms of actions are shares, uh, subscriptions, and click-throughs. But again, a massive caveat on uh, call to actions. When brands are beginning their journey on YouTube for the first time, and they have a history of advertising with us on Google. Um, 
there can often be an expectation that some of those call to actions will mirror or should benchmark against what's going on with search. Um, and that isn't always the best way to look at it because search is an intent driven platform. So people go to search once they have decided that they might want something and generally or very often leads to transactions. Now with YouTube, it's more about consideration and awareness. So when you, when you do set your KPIs based on actions, don't compare it to search. Okay, so now I wanna go back to Hub, uh, Hero, and Help. So these are some of the distinct distribution strategies for different content. I will go through some of the examples because often it's a bit easier to understand what we talk about within this framework once you see those examples. Now for Hero, again, this is your Dove sketches, your big ticket, very loud, um, major campaigns that you run. Some of the examples that we've seen for Hero in terms of content distribution, because the content is often very, very strong and it's the most important uh, content for your brand that you want to reach the biggest audience as possible. Dove Sketches, for example, knew that they were onto an absolute winner with that campaign. Because they were onto a winner, <coughs> people will often talk about it as being a very viral campaign, but that's not necessarily the truth. They put in an enormous amount of planning to make sure that content was distributed in an effective manner, so much so that even though it got a huge amount of organic uplift, for every one organic view or share that they got, there was five paid views behind that campaign. So they understood the importance of running, and the, the product that they used was uh, TrueView. You might have come across it before uh, today or during your day-to-day -day jobs. Um, and that's a pre-roll. So across over 20 markets in the world, they had an enormous amount of media run as pre-rolls, skippable ads, um, and that's what triggered what people consider to be a viral campaign which was shared across the world. Uh, the second example I wanted to show you was a client of ours. So that's a masthead. It's a homepage takeover on YouTube. This client is Sega, Sega Games. So Sega were creating a, they were launching their new, new game, which is called Warhammer. Um, and Sega knew that within the entertainment space, when a new game is launched, there's an enormous amount of excitement about it. But that excitement doesn't last for very long because a new game from somewhere else is launching in a couple of weeks, and therefore they need to act very quickly in, um, with whatever media activity they're doing. So they chose to run uh, home pages in five different markets, the five markets that were really important to them, so the US, Canada, and then three of their bigger markets in Europe. And that gave them hundreds of millions um, as, in terms of reach, 100 million users that were interested in their brand um, and they were able to do that in 24 hours, which then triggered a conversation online. So because they knew they had such a short period of time to roll out their hero product, they chose a mass set because that was um, the best way to do that in 24 hours. And then finally, BMW. So again, BMW took a lot of the guesswork out of how to distribute their content. They realized with a bit of research that actually their audience were particularly snobby about the type of content, the type of automotive content they watched on YouTube. So automotive is absolutely huge as a category on YouTube, but they found that for BMW themselves, their audience only watched the 50 most well-known and established automotive channels. So once they had created their hero content, they only rolled it out to those 50 partner channels. And even though they got that mass reach, it was confined to a very targeted audience. Okay, so now I wanted to talk a little bit about Hub. So Hub is your episodic content. It's not as big ticket as Hero. Um, it is usually integrated in a very clear strategy where you will continue to draw uh, an interest from your users and get them coming back to watch your content. This is probably the most effective uh, content to get right. This is where it really pays off because you move from consider consideration and awareness and over time in towards intent. Pepsi Max, um, have anyone ever seen Pepsi Max before? Not many. So Pepsi Max, this, this, uh, this campaign has won a huge amount of awards. It's called Genius. Um, it's run in the UK, but they would regularly um, 
regularly upload new content around Genius, and they have already established 100,000 um, users to will come back and watch us all the time. But I didn't want to talk about Pepsi because I was expecting more people to know about it. Um, I wanted to talk about American Express. And, and American Express's content distribution strategy was very, very smart around Hub. So what they did was they built a series of content within three distinct buckets. So these are all episodic content, but confined to different target audiences that they were trying to reach. The first one was around their current existing members, so the guys who already had American Express cards. This is their 35 to 55 year olds. So they created a series of content to highlight the loyalty programs that they had. So some of the uh, point systems, double points, some of the holidays that are available in order to keep the current user base happy with the product and continuing to use American Express. Now they knew that that type of content wasn't relevant for a growth area that they identified, which was small business owners. So they then created a different set of content and targeted very, very carefully small business owners on YouTube with content that was very relevant to those business owners. And then finally, they also understood that they wanted to target a new audience. So they reached out to the 21 to 25 year old target audience um, who were, most of them were getting jobs for the first time, they were getting credit cards for the first time, but they wouldn't have been interested in the type of content that existed elsewhere, so they created different content that was appropriate for 21 to 25 year olds, um, and they were able to engage that audience uh, based on their passion points. So I deliberately don't want to talk too much about our products. Uh, what I'm hoping to talk about, as you know, is content distribution, but it is important to note that remarketing around the hub content distribution strategy is particularly effective. Because the nature of this content is episodic, um, remarketing can be really valuable because you're, targeting an, you're building an audience list and targeting them again based on their proven interest in content which is similar to what you will uh, continue to roll out again and again and again. So <clears throat> remarketing is effective, to be honest, in all of our product range, but in particular for hub content, it is it, the most effective. Okay, finally help. So again, um, help is your response to the type of questions you've seen come up again and again on your social media platforms. And this can be really simple stuff. So we've all seen that there's a huge amount of how-to videos uh, on YouTube. What Gillette have done, for example, is very simply how to shave. Shaving tips for men. They recognize that at entry point there is an enormous amount of people who are, well, for me about 19, but for most people about 14, who come on to you know, who start to shave, don't know exactly what they're doing, maybe are too embarrassed to ask, and it's very, very easy. You go, you go to YouTube, you find a how-to, it's branded by Gillette, and that in significantly increases the chances of converting a new user um, to Gillette right from, from the off. Another example of appliances online. So again, does anyone know who appliances online are? A couple of hands. Um, I really like this story. Appliances online sell white goods. Fridges, freezers, dishwashers, really, really boring stuff. Um, and it's actually, so, this company was launched off the back of a bet on Christmas Eve 15 years ago. So some guy, I think it was in Bolton, some guy bet his mate one pound that he couldn't set up a company that sold white goods. The guy took on the bet, and is now worth $440 million uh, 15 years later, and is now the number one distributor of white goods in the UK. And he's done this by creating a company based around customer service. So again, by looking into all of the insights and research that you can do online, he found out very quickly that people absolutely hate buying white goods. So it takes time, people don't know what the right product is because they don't care. Um, they don't know what to do with their existing appliance, where do you put it, and often it takes time to adjust to getting used to the new product because it's just not something people know much about. So what they've done is they've created free delivery, next day delivery, guaranteed to be at three o'clock, if we say three o'clock delivery. Um, remove your existing um, appliance from your home, recycle it, 
have a customer service call center that will immediately send you a new product if your product is, is broken or if you can't fix it, or if it's not genuinely broken, they will send flowers for the inconvenience that it wasn't set up properly because they're supposed to. Now, that's incredible in terms of customer service, but their, their help strategy is to document everything they do around customer service on their YouTube content so that when users are trying to figure out, or if they happen to reach users who are about to replace or buy a new white good, they can see very quickly that all of the advantages that mean a lot to a user exist with appliances online, and therefore it's more likely they'll go to them. Another example of help, and this is for any of you guys who work on brands that uh, are involved in sponsorship. So Under Armour sponsored Tough Mudder. If you are unfamiliar with what Tough Mudder is, it's one of those extreme uh, endurance type competitions where you jump over fences and under ropes. Um, now again, they took the guesswork out of it. They looked at the research, they tried to understand what the Tough Mudder audience were looking for and consuming on YouTube. So what were their passion points? And they saw that actually when people who were, um, the guys, the contestants of Tough Mudder uh, were very interested in unique and niche training um, programs. So they, because they were about to involve themselves in a uh, strange and difficult training pro uh, competition, they wanted to know how to do particular training regimes that weren't easily available online or weren't easily um, searchable on YouTube. And then they created a whole series of content around this, um, which is very relevant to uh, help content. Okay, so as you've seen, there are three different types of content distribution strategies, uh, th different types of content formats, but it's very important that they all um, <clears throat> integrate into one strategy. So don't try and uh, set up three different types of content distribution formats without remembering that you need to all roll it up into one strategy. An example of this, a recent example of this is Nike. So hands up if you guys think, hands up who thinks Nike were one of the official sponsors of the World Cup last year. I'm gonna say hands up if you don't think they were because I don't think people are putting their hands up. So hands up if you don't think Nike were an official sponsor. Okay, so everyone who didn't put their hand up is right. Um, so Nike were not an official sponsor. They chose, Adidas were the official sponsor, but they, they felt they wanted to win the World Cup regardless of not being um, a, <clears throat> one of the official sponsors. So they put a huge amount of time, energy, and thought into planning a content distribution strategy in the four week period of the World Cup. Now that involved the 18 players that they have as ambassadors, and they are very strategically selected as ambassadors because they are placed in various uh, geographies <clears throat> which will allow them to build content in hero format where they will roll out globally, but also uh, hub content that can target local regional areas that are relevant to maybe one or two of those ambassadors. They also knew that these, um, these players had 350 million followers on their own social media networks. So they knew that they could piggyback off all of the followers of Ronaldo and Ibrahimovic um, in order to get that real bang from the four week period that they were trying to orchestrate their content. And in the end, Nike had more views than any other of the official sponsors in the World Cup. So by carefully planning, by thinking, putting a huge amount of thought into not just their content, but also their distribution plans, they were able to just get incredible results and incredible engagement from their campaign, despite not being the official sponsor. Which is something that I would encourage all you guys to do. So we've seen time and time again, YouTube can be a brilliant platform for challenger brands. In this case, Nike is a huge brand, but it was the challenger brand for the World Cup. In other examples, Dollar Shave Club is not a Gillette, but the platform, if it's targeted, if the users within the platform are targeted correctly, will allow you, even as a challenger, um, to succeed and very often to win and build your brand. Build your brand. 
So with that, I think I'm out of time. I will be definitely out in the sunshine later on, um, hopefully enjoying a Guinness. So if you have any questions about content distribution strategy and wanted to share some of your ideas, I'd be really, really happy to talk you through it and look forward to seeing you then. Hello?